Hi. Hey, how you doing? I'm good, thank you. How about you? Good. I'm glad you made it in today to the new um, you know, I did some new things. This thing is so confusing to me because it it has me scheduled for two different things, but I'm glad you made it. And some more people are trying to make it through. I just sent them the the link. So they're gonna, hey. So we're getting they're they're trickling in little by little. Okay. So I'm gonna try and help them get. I'm gonna try and respond to some emails to help some people get situated. Yeah, I'm on here. Oh, wonderful. How you doing? I'm good and you. I'm great. So good to see you. I'm gonna try and help some more people get here that might have been confused. By okay, cool. So I'm just gonna to respond to some emails here with the updated information for the Zoom meeting. Is that okay? Here we go. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How about you? That's good. I'm good too. What's new in your world? Um, nothing much. Same stuff. <laughs> yep. Okay. Jelani. Okay, so I just sent that to her. I'm a, I'm gonna mute myself until um everything is going. Okay. Okay, I'm almost done, you guys. That's where I'll respond to this one more person. And if after that, we'll just get our show on the road. We got some good stuff today. Mm. All right, so let's get let's get let's get going here. Hey, you made it, mahogany! I'm so happy. <laughs> Hey, John, how you doing? <clears throat> All right, you guys, it's 538. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. I'm going to start with a screen share. And I'm going to my PowerPoint. Well, I'm just going to go to a regular screen share. Hope you guys aren't shy here. Okay, so let me get started with going to my PowerPoint here. And if anyone can't hear me, then just raise your hand or just um, if you need me to stop and slow down or go over something, then just raise your hand or just, you know, cut your mic on and speak up. Uh, don't feel shy about interrupting. Okay, what, what, what are these right now? Oh, yeah, what'd you say? I can hear you now. Okay, what are these? What are you just showing some um, emails you sent? Um, I'm going to blow this up right now so you can see this see this um, PowerPoint. Let, tell me if you can see it. Yeah, save our kids. I'm trying to make the full screen. Good, your papa's coming. Is it okay now? Can you see? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Okay, good. Mahogany can see. John, are, are you with us? Can you get a thumbs up from you? Are you okay, John? Your papa's coming. All right, you guys. Okay, so if everyone can mute and, their- um, He just said in chat that he doesn't hear any audio. Do you hear now, John? <sighs> yeah, because I don't have the chat open because I have the PowerPoint. Yes, on. he hears now, so. Okay. <laughs> thank okay. you so much. I's glad everybody's got it going. So thank you for joining us tonight. We're gonna be discussing 
Um, tonight, our topic of discussion is legislative acts and executive orders that give us the legal standing to file a lawsuit in court for um, the deprivation of rights by child and welfare services. Now, some people ask, well, how is this gonna help me get my kids back? Well, the only way you can get your kids back is if you file a lawsuit and a judge orders that they must give your children back. A judge has to make the order that they, um, based on the fact that they violated protocol, your kids were removed um, under the wrong basis and your rights were deprived. And in addition to that, if there was fraud upon the court, you have to prove that it was fraud and not just perjury, but it was an overall intent to deceive by a judicial officer. And both of those things can get you injunctive relief. Um, and injunctive relief is the kind of relief that means that you are no longer bound by the orders of that court and you can have all of your rights and privileges back. So when people ask me, how is this gonna help get my kids back is very straightforward. There's no marching down the street or holding up signs. And those are things are wonderful. I, I absolutely think, thank all of those parents who brought awareness for us. But for us today, in order to make action, we have to have an order from an authority. So in order to appeal to the authority, we have to make our case to the authority that we know what we're talking about. All right, so federal acts which all state child welfare agencies must comply. The United States Senate, as you see, um, oh, let me go back here. Oh, I gotta go back. Okay, I'm going, I'm going down here. The United States Senate, you guys, um, they make acts and pass legislative orders that the federal government must comply with. And these are our elected officials. So why do we need to refer to these legislative acts? Well, these are the law of the land. Everyone must comply with this, all the states. And I see some parent groups are focused in their state, but it's so difficult to make changes at the state level because the state is not going to prosecute itself. They're not gonna hold itself accountable. So you can't ask a criminal to turn himself in or to plead guilty. They're not gonna testify against themselves. So you have to have someone higher than the state who can prosecute the state for their crimes. So that's why when you have the groups at the state level, it can be frustrating and you feel like you're not making any progress because the state officials are the ones who are who are doing the corruption and it's gonna be very hard to get them to admit to that. So the federal legislation has the agreed upon terms and expectations in this social contract. So you need to use the right terminology um, the, the contractual terminology when addressing the breach of contract. You need to know what the contract says. So many people say, my rights were deprived, but what are your rights? Did you read the contract to know what it says? It's in black and white, which means it's undeniable. When you quote their words back to them, it shows that you have respect for their institutions and their authority, and you sound credible and confident. So don't rely on your own knowledge. Make sure you Go to references like here, senate.gov, and look at what the legislative says. So I'm gonna help you navigate the different federal websites and government legislative acts that give you the authority to appeal to this court to let them know that your rights were violated. All right, so we're gonna start first with the Family First Prevention Services Act. <clears throat> How can I move this? Excuse me. The Family First Prevention Services Act from 2018 from, pres from excuse me, former president, or I don't know what the status is right now, Donald J. Trump, for the Title IV Social Security Act. Um, it provides compelling reasons why the child should, unless there's compelling reasons why the child should not return, return home, children are presumed to be um, in the best interest with their, with their family. That's kind of the presumption unless there's some overwhelming evidence in the contrary. So if they haven't provided compelling reasons 
why the ch your child should not be returned home in and um, and, I'm, and I'm not saying compelling as compared to their court, but people outside the court will look at that and wonder how they came to that conclusion. And this is one of the areas that they violated the code of civil procedure. So in a moment, we're going to look at pages 280 through 281 in this document and discuss how states are under an obligation to document intensive, ongoing, unsuccessful efforts to place the child with the family before they can place them in foster care, which they skip over many times. They don't um, put forth any effort, let alone intensive, ongoing, and unsuccessful. Um, to see where, what exactly they're, they're asked to do for these reasonable efforts, you can go to these websites here. Um, they'll be available on the PowerPoint. And you can click these websites here and it'll take you straight to where you need to go to, to see what these things say. So, but I'm gonna go ahead. All right, Adoption Assistance and Child Welfare Act from 1980. This was implemented by um, former President Bill Clinton. It says Congress must impose such rights unambiguous when it intends to impose conditions on the grant of federal monies. They have the power to enforce congressional spending conditions, which means they put the conditions on what these welfare agencies must do in order to obtain the money from the federal government. So what happens many times is that they they will they can't meet those conditions so they'll make false documents and saying that they did make those meet those conditions in order to obtain the money. So when you share your case with us in your affidavit, you're showing that they did not meet these conditions and that they've been obtaining this money without meeting those conditions. And that's what your complaint is here, that they um, denied you your rights. It's basically the same language as the Family First Prevention Services Act. And it, it just doesn't boil, it just goes to show you, it doesn't boil down to the language, it boils down to enforcement in courts because they say that they do it, but they don't actually. So without the lawsuit, they can just go around and do it and then wait for someone to catch up with them. And if a person never catches up with them, then they pretty much broke the law and got away with it. So I have some documents here that pretty much show that child welfare agency problems have gone back even as far as to John F. Kennedy and dare I say before, John F. Kennedy here and some of his memos had made some complaints about the child welfare agency as you see here. Um, if you look closely, um, excuse me, let me go back. If you look closely, it says, it uses the language on the very last page here, page three, adoption rackets. So adoption rackets or conspiracies that we'll get into a little bit later are something that you should become familiar with in the fact that people make use the adoption uh, as a racket to make money and your children and your family are, are oftentimes the product in the human trafficking. So we're going to look shortly at a case, Sutter versus Artiste. This is a case where the federal government or the federal courts ruled in the parents' favor. Um, they showed that the states did not make reasonable efforts in preventing the removal of the child or terminating the parents' rights, or they did not they failed to act. In this case, they did not make reasonable efforts. And there, um, I also have here that they failed to grant an opportunity for a fair hearing. So um, in addition to those things, um, reasonable efforts made to prevent removal of the child are one of the main reasons that, uh, or one of the main things that they violate, but they violate so many other things, especially with not giving someone a fair hearing and not allowing children to be heard in court. Children don't have adequate representation. So if any of those things have happened in your case, then you definitely qualify. So I'm going to be asking people to read in a moment. So just get ready. Okay. I think we've read the part about conspiracy before, but this is one of the um, the fact that it's a, a an adoption racket. We're accusing these child welfare agencies of operating a conspiracy or colluding between two or more people in order to remove children from the home and make money from the money that comes with that. So the reason why we want people to be in right standing and not have any pending criminal charges or um, 
still not being in a stable circumstances because the de dependency case can't continue against you or they cannot justify removing your child if your circumstances are improved. So we want everyone to be in right standing so that way no one can have a cause of action against them to say that they shouldn't have the child or their own children. All right, so we're gonna take a little break here and have a history lesson on why bearing false witness has, has always been a very popular um, way for people to deal with each other and get what they want from each other. So I'm gonna exit the screen share right now and I'm going to let everyone kind of chime in. Um, well, after, after I'm gonna actually go back and let someone read, whoever raises their hand, let's me know they want to read um, this section. And then I'm gonna let everyone chime in on how they feel like they may they can relate to this situation here. So who wants to read the next slide? This is I will read, but I cannot see. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna share the screen and then you'll be able to see it. Okay. No, no, I'm saying well my glasses, my eyes are not that good. Oh, okay. Um okay. Sorry. Well, hold on, let me just um, see if I can, should I make it bigger? Is that what I should do? Okay, let me make this bigger. Let me share the screen and make it bigger. Okay. And then I'm going to do like this. Is that bigger? I'm still- I can read and she can't see. Okay, Mahogany, you want to just go ahead and chop it up for us? Yes, Exodus 16, verse 15 through 18, verse 15, 21, 19, 16, 9, 7, 37, Exodus 16. I, Jezebel, bore false witness against God's prophet, a court of law, in order to have killed and obtained his vineyard. Two, People have been bearing false witness at the end of time, which is why it is the ninth of the ten commandments in Exodus 26. Three, God is shutting down those institutions and is urging the home school, your children, to take full responsibility for their education that you may keep your children first in the way of God. Effectively, the skills they need to be a productive. Okay, thank you so much. So the reason why I shared this with you is because under social under the Social Security Act, which we're going to see later on, they are able to um, to get a hold of you as a person. And then if there's something that you have that they want, which is usually your children, they'll use the court in order to bear false witness against you. So I'm going to read um, 1 Kings chapter 21, and it will, um, and then I'm going to have a let you have a discussion on, on if you think that your court proceeding was fundamentally flawed, and if you didn't have a fair hearing, such as your child didn't have a chance to express what they want, that's one thing. If you uh, didn't have a chance to to speak or present evidence. Um, if you feel like the judge and the social worker were working together, any of those things. I just, want, I just want you to think about that while I read this passage. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house. And I will give thee for a better vineyard than it, or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, 
why is thou spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and he said unto him, give me the vineyard for money or else. If it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, and sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters, saying, Proclaim a fast, and set Naboth on high among the people and set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who were in the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had said unto them. And it was written into the letters which she had said unto them. They proclaimed a, a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and set before him, and the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass when, Naboth Je when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise! Take possession of the vineyard, and Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Well, this is just First Kings. I'll have to share with you Second Kings next week, which happens to Jezebel, but... Who can tell me a little bit about their story and if they feel like who they are in this story, in this old, old ancient story, and how they might have been treated the same way? Uh, one at a time, please. Mahogany? Yes, I definitely can feel like I was taken out and stoned. Just, I did not die, but... Um, yeah, it was for the children so they can get the welfare. That's sad that they are out for blood and you don't realize who your enemy or opponent really is until it is a matter of life or death, or at least you feel like that. And mm -hmm. uh, people were expecting me to die, but I'm glad I'm alive. And now it's time to go hold these bad demons accountable. Okay, thank you so much. Who else wants to share next? Okay, Renisha. I definitely feel like um, they treated me exactly how um, Monogany said that she was, you know, stoned. And um, it's just like they tried to kill you and take your soul or your kid's soul or something. And it's just... It's crazy. You know, a lot of people, they just don't believe it. But if you're like, uh, read the Bible, a lot of it is kind of like that. And it's just, I don't know, everybody doesn't really um, know. And I'm just glad that it's getting put out there so we can get help. And I hope that it just doesn't happen to other people. Well, that's good about being a class action is because it goes, anybody who, who qualifies can be helped by what's going on here today. And uh, we have so many, we have so many um, people who have sent in their affidavits already. Um, Tiana, do you want to, do you want to share anything with your, with how you can relate to the story? Yes. Uh, I mean, I was discriminated against uh, in many ways. Another thing uh, they did kill, they killed the bond that my son and I had. Uh, they, um, I mean, they killed the, how my ch child would develop. I mean, everything is different. So maybe they didn't uh, physically uh, kill anything, but emotionally they did. So yes. uh, they've, um, especially my son, he's affected a lot with this. So, and um, 
maybe that because he's just four years old that doesn't manifest now but one day if uh, it's gonna manifest a lot you know yes, if i don't get definitely. reunited with him so thank you so much and i just yes. like to highlight that you know these were false allegations against this man and he paid with his, with his life um this prophet of god he paid with his life for jezebel's lies and she did it all just because she wanted his land. She wanted his birthright that he refused to give her. And your children are your birthright. So let's not think of it as something so far-fetched that someone would go to court and lie to obtain something from us. Because as we see in this text, it's something that's as old as the beginning of time. So I just wanted to break things up and let people share so they can see what kind of force that we're dealing with. People think that Jezebel was some type of seductress, but really she was just a regular common court liar running the mill that we see every day. And next week when we read Second Kings, we're gonna see what happens to her and how she comes to a terrible end and how we know that the people who are bearing false witness are gonna to come to that same exact terrible end when we finish our lawsuit. All right, so let me start the screen share back. Okay. I'm going to take a break from the, the PowerPoint and I'm going to go over here to some. <clears throat> I'm going to share with you some of the executive orders that I'm speaking about. So this executive order also um, similar to the Family First Prevention Act from Donald Trump basically states that they're trying to strengthen the child welfare system. And if you look at the specific areas for improving, it says they will be the EO, this executive order will improve federal oversight of key statutory requirements by requiring Title IV reviews and Child and Family Services reviews to strengthen the assessments of critical requirements including reasonable efforts to prevent removal and to finalize per per permanency plans for children in foster care, filing petitions for termination of parental rights as appropriate within statutory timelines and conducting family search and notification when children come in foster care, issuing guidance on the use of federal funds to support high quality legal representation for parents and children, high quality legal representation. You don't have to settle for less. Right. So we, you know, we are kind of just so used to, um, you know, we don't want to read, right. We want to skip over things and we want someone else to read for us and we want someone else to fight for us. But our lack of knowledge is what gets us in trouble because when someone else skips it and doesn't read, we don't know what we're missing out on. So here, um, I have a couple things highlighted. This is from the, I'm gonna to go to all the way to the top so you can see. This is an article, Legal Accountability and Service-Based Welfare State Lessons from Child Welfare Reform, right? So we're gonna learn how, which things have to be done in order to make them reform. So, it says right here, in the 1990s, Congress turned to bureaucratic control. Statutes had long obliged the states to report a broad range of data on their child welfare activities and the Administration for Children and Families of the Department of Health and Human Services has long been charged with monitoring state compliance and federal statutory requirements. Um, let's see, let me get to the most important part. I'm going to be sharing all of these with you, which I would love for you to read at your um, read the whole thing. You know, it's easy to skip over it, but read it and you'll become so empowered um, knowing that exactly what the problem is. Public law litigation. We have noticed we have noted that in about two thirds of the states, all or parts of the child welfare sink system has been successfully challenged in lawsuits seeking systematic injunctive relief. So they have noticed in their paper that when there are lawsuits that seek systematic injunctive relief, 
they are successful. And that is why we do what we do. The challenges involve demonstrations or concessions of massive non-compliance with federal requirements, failure to take action or in response to indications of, abu of abuse and neglect, comma, arbitrary removal of children without reason reasonable reunification efforts, and placement of children in inappropriate, often dangerous settings without substantial consideration. This is, uh, let's see how I can make it bigger. So it'll be easier for people to see. Let's make this nice and big. So it's easy to see here why there's evidence in, your, in our favor already that's supporting what we're saying here. So please, you guys, when I add this to the website, please, please, please read it. Next, we're going to go on to, um, this is another article you can read at your, at your leisure, but it basically speaks about the need for child welfare reform and how this case that we're going to talk about, Sutter versus Artists, helped, refer, helped reform child care. <clears throat> this is the Social Security Act, which we'll, we will read later on, which talks about all of the things that we're entitled to, and I like to skip down to page to section 471, even though there's lots of great sections here. Okay, it's the boring stuff, but it's the devil is in the details, you guys. Um, they know that people don't read, and because they won't read, then they can slip stuff in there on them. But when you sit there and read and you hold them to their words, then they're surprised and, and they comply because they see you've done your due, your due diligence. Section 471. All right. This ensures that, provides that states shall not fail to grant an opportunity for a fair hearing as described in paragraph 12 to an individuals whose allegations are in violation of said paragraph A. So as you see here, if you did not receive a fair hearing, they have violated the law. Let's keep going. In the United States, oh, this is not the one that I wanted to do. Oh, hmm, where is the Sutter versus Ariest? Okay, let me share a different part of the screen. Okay. Okay. Do I have any questions or comments so far? Does anybody want to ask a question or make a comment about anything? Um, I want to talk, but not about this. Um, uh, but I can ask you when it's a little bit done, if you want me to. Okay. Well, I'll try and wrap this up really quickly, so we'll have more time to talk. So um, here I am back at the Save Our Kids website. Um, this is the very first thing up there, reasonable efforts. What are they? Um, you can click through this. It's about 58 pages, and it tells you exactly what these efforts are. Child care, homemaker services, individual group counseling, health care services, vocational counseling. Um, they can even help you pay for your rent and things of that nature. So if they didn't do any of these things, then... Um, they definitely skipped a step, a bit major step. So let's, so I always start here. Um, next, you can read the cease and desist letter that we've written. Um, I'd love for you to print this out and sign it and send it to um, Lynn Johnson, the Administration for Children and Family Health Services over the United States. Um, so you send them the cease and desist letter to let them know that you will be suing them and it's the first step in that process. This is a copy of the federal claim. So if you want to see what is what do we have in court, what have we filed in court, this is what we filed in court right here. Um, I'm going to stop the screen share again to show you that we actually got a response from the court. And I'm going to read it to you so you see what it says. Um, let me go grab it real quick. In the meantime, I'm going to take you to um, this really great, let's see, 
where is the lawsuit I wanted to talk to you about? Sutter versus. Mm. Okay, just give me, just bear with me for one minute. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share. Okay, so as you see in this lawsuit here, uh, Sutter versus Artiste, it's basically, um, it just basically uh, a claim that was brought to the United States government, which the parents won, that they got their children back. Um, it claimed that the, the child welfare services didn't follow the protocol. And since they breached the protocol, they're negligent. And therefore, since they did that, they had to return, to return the children. So people do get their children back, you guys. Here is our lawsuit that we have, the response that I got. Um, the response basically says, that we have been assigned a judge, as you see, we've been assigned a judge, Chief Judge Eleni M. Rumel, and we're gonna be filing, e-filing, since the, because of the coronavirus. So I just have to sign these documents saying that we're gonna be e-filing um, because of the coronavirus. So I'll be sending back and forth documentation. Once you send me in your affidavits, I'm gonna be attaching that to the lawsuit. Um, I'll be sending you documents to certify that you're part of the class. Um, I'll just be following up with you to ask for doc whatever documents that I might need to just to verify that you qualify for injunctive relief under this lawsuit that we're filing. So this is our federal court. Our lawsuit has been accepted, you guys. It was not rejected. So that is very, very, very good news. <laughs> All right. So we're making this progress. Yay. <laughs> Are you going to? Thank you, Mel. And um, are you going to send them to um, emails, the paper you need us, or to Mel? Uh, yeah, everything goes through email. Um, okay. Or, or I'll just upload it onto Save Our Kids, and then you'll download it, sign it, and then upload it and send it back to me like that. You could download it on, on, on the phone or download it on, like... On the phone, paper. too, yeah. You can download it on the phone. Um, it just goes to... Um, you just go to take action and then you submit your affidavit. That's just, I, I mean, I, and I upload, every, I, that's the first step is the affidavit. I did that. I'm not too sure. Um, I just barely did, did that. I don't know if uh, I did it right. Uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead. If you send it, if you submit it again, or if I just, if you just give me some time to go through it and look for it, then I'll okay. read it and let you know what changes it, it needs. But everything that I'm including here tonight on this, can you can include those as arguments that you want to make inside your affidavit because that makes it stronger. Okay, and then there's uh, um, some few other things that I wanted to. Well, you could tell you can finish up wrapping this up and then I'll ask. Okay, you. great. I'll finish up and then we'll get to all the all those questions. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to finish up the PowerPoint, you guys, and then we'll be done for tonight and we'll get to the personal questions. All right, so we all know what, what we've been through. We're going to find out exactly how this story ends and i think that our story is going to end very similar Amen. i believe that because i believe in all the promises made by god and all the promises that are made to me under the constitution amen so we have um we're going to skip this for now uh okay actually no we need to go back to that one well we'll just skip a portion of it but here um, could I have someone read section two for me right here? Oh, I'm sorry. I just clicked over it. Let me go back. Just section two. Any takers? If not, okay, I'll just go ahead. It. Okay. Uh, Tiana, you want to go ahead? Yes, every person who under color of any statute, ordinance, regulation, custom, or usage of any state or territory or the District of Columbia subject or cause to be subjected, any citizen of the United States or other person within the jurisdiction thereof to the deprivation of any rights, 
privileges or immunities secured by the constitution and laws shall be liable to the party injured in an action at uh, law suit in equity or other proper proceeding for redress, except that in any action brought against a judici judicial officer for an act or commission omission taken in such officer's judic judicial capacity, injunctive relief shall not be granted unless a declaratory degree was violated or declaratory relief was unavailable. All right, you guys. So was a declaratory decree violated? Yes or no? Yes. yes. It was. I just So we just showed you with all of the different orders and acts, these declaratory degrees were violated, which makes us, um, which qualify for injunctive relief. All right. So that is all for that. And even though you may not know people personally, who um, who have gone through this method? I have countless. Um, actually, let me let me go do one more screen share, real quick before we stop, and then I'm going to show you on the website where you can see that there are countless lawsuits. Um, where, let's see, let me find it for you real quick. All right, this article right here reforming a system that cannot reform itself, child welfare reforms by class action lawsuit. This shows the people who have settled their lawsuits maybe quietly because the government doesn't like to admit to wrongdoing out loud and in public. So you may not know some parents have gotten their kids back in monetary settlements, but that could be you in a very few short months. So uh, even though you haven't we haven't been successful at other means and I know you're probably frustrated and feel like you've done everything and nothing's worked. This is, has proven to be an effective method for, um, for getting these court orders voided um, and having your children return to you and also receiving the monetary damages that are related to what happened. So on that note, we will, um, Let's see, I want to show you one more thing. It's just so interesting. <laughs> this was the John F. Kennedy part that I got earlier, you guys, right here. And this is him saying, as big as possible, um, as large as possible about the adoption rackets. Uh, and also using barbiturates and tranquilizers on children, you know, when they medicate the children as well. So. We have plenty of evidence here to, to document what's been going on and I hope everyone's excited. I know it's been a long road and you're very frustrated and you, there's, there's still gonna be enemies coming ahead trying to tell you that it's not gonna work or just to give up, just to quit or, but don't ever run a long race and then get to the finish line and quit. That's not the right thing to do. To get across the finish line, you guys. That's what I'm urging you to do. So on that note, I'm gonna close up and I, I would like for people to ask questions about you know, they, what they have as far as um, how far they how far along they are, they are with their affidavits and how they might need any help. Mahogany? Yes, I need help. I wasn't able to start yet, but remember how I was telling you I got the million kids and <laughs> but all these things apply, but it's just, yeah. I guess, a matter of coming up with the dates and getting everything, I guess, in paper, but um, had had a chance to look up the statutes either, but I got everything like pretty much written down. And then uh, I just wanted to get with you to hone it all in, I guess. Yeah, let's just set up a time. And really, if you could, when we when you do come, you know, set up a meeting, just have anything written up, even if it's in a rough draft, you know, just have something typed up about your whole story and what happened. You don't have to go through every detail because obviously that's what that's the benefit of being in the group that you don't have to go through every detail because it's our collective stories that's the problem we're showing that there's systematic change and no one's going to go through you know each and every little thing but if you use the um if you look through the stuff on save our kids website that should be more than enough for you to have to cite statutes you know or, or at least an act or anything you don't have to to cite the exact statutes but some type of act or some type of reference to some type of federal government um, authority to, that they violated. You just had to okay. find something that they violated. 
Okay. So I guess we'll just uh, do this. When can you, uh, when do you want me to set the appointment? I mean, when your calendar going to be open? I'm sorry. Probably Friday. Friday. I'll look on Friday to make an appointment. Okay, cool. All right. All right. Thank next? you. You're welcome so much. All right. I see you, uh, Renisha. Okay. Um, right there where it says, um, where we're billing the affidavit out. I don't know where it says um, uh, the court numbers I need in case number. I didn't understand that part. Well, we just want to, to show that you had some type of court case. Mm -hmm. So if you had a court case somewhere, um, just write that case number down. Like whichever, any paper I got. Yeah, yeah any paperwork just to show that you have some, to relate it to some court somewhere, some judge, you know, something to show that you're, you know, you, you have an actual case. Okay, do you know where you can get um, papers if I don't have any of them anymore? Well, um, where I could go? Well, I really don't know if you could dig up something old, but if not, then just back to the same court that you were and Okay. I, yeah, something. It just doesn't, if you don't have anything, then um, just don't let that stop you. You can get it later. Okay, no, just my folder got stolen and like, all kinds of other stuff for my house for my case. Yeah, from the clerk of court, just ask her for some for a minute order. Okay. Uh, what's what's it called? A minute order. Okay, at the courts. The clerk of courts, yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. And then uh, one more other thing: who, uh, um, how many defendants do I list, and exactly who am I? Who did I list under there that I'm trying to um, file a lawsuit against? Clamp. Well, we're filing a lawsuit against the United States government. So that part I should have put. So that. you don't have to, but when it when it comes to the perpetrators of the mm -hmm. of the injury, you want to to list who specifically injured you, and if you don't, you know their first name. If you have it, the more information you know, the better. On this day, they um they could they uh deny my child the right to be heard in court. Okay. Um or on this day, oh, denying your child a right to be heard in court is a big one, you guys. If your child has ever said they want to go home and they did not put, say that to the court, then that's denying them proper legal representation. Okay. So another one is denying you proper legal representation. <laughs> if you didn't have a chance to present evidence in, in your favor okay. and defend yourself, then that's inadequate. If they painted you in a false light, which means they said all bad stuff about you when there's good stuff about you too, but they did not tell the whole story. You know, so there's all types of ways, or if they listened to someone who had a criminal record for lying, um, all of these things, or if they removed your child without trying to give you help, or if you took the help and then they still didn't accept all the things that you did, you know, they just, so we have a, a million different ways to approach the same. It's like, um, it's all the same thing, just in a, from a different okay. angle. They're okay. just being fraudulent. They had they weren't being forthcoming. And overall, there's a general neglect for the rules and procedures and the code of conduct that they're supposed to have professionally. And so you just say that you know you didn't feel like you were your you felt like your rights were violated and you weren't treated with respect and dignity as a human being. Um, you're a great parent. They didn't prove their case, but they still took them from you anyway. And uh, once you once you feel like fill that out, I'm going to add it to the lawsuit. We're going to um, put put everyone's court. You know, you have to have a court case for us to overturn it. So that's one reason why the court case number is important because we can't overturn something that doesn't exist. So whatever court order they use to take your child, give us that court order, and that's okay. the one that'll be nullified. Okay, I could get that. Yeah. Thank you. Yay, yay, yay. So um, some people, they um, they have something where the DCFS did not act when the child was being neglected or abused or um, they, you know, they have different cases, but if you felt like overall the, the, um, the process was not, was not, the hearing was not fair, right? The hearing's got to be fair, you guys. You don't have to settle for a fair hearing. You don't have to, oh, well, well, you probably did it. Oh, well, well, we didn't get, no, there's no skipping steps. If any step was skipped and you want to go ahead and bring that to light. 
So we're we're early. Uh, we have five minutes. I can let you go early, but if you have some more questions, I can definitely answer some more questions, or I can show you some sample affidavits if you want. Yes, I would like to. Okay, let me go, let me go, let me go to a sample affidavit. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Tiana. I would like to see that. Okay, great. Hold on, hold on, you guys. Hold on, baby. Hold on. can you hear me yes i can hear you now yes so i wanted to ask you did you had chance of uh checking the after david i did i wrote before um i'm actually going to be checking all affidavits this week i really had to just um I really just had to make sure that people had all the information that they needed. And so I haven't had a chance to read over all the affidavits because I'm, you know, there's so many affidavits coming in. I have about 200 of them. I'm only through, through about 50. So I'm trying to take them in order. Yes, yeah. because I wanted to say mine that I wrote first when we started uh, talking and stuff, it's not good because I didn't know uh, which number of tort claim. And then I didn't include a paper from my actual court proceedings i okay. included paper from my uh from my appeal but that's not i think uh but i have meeting with you tomorrow so we can okay. talk about that more yeah we'll definitely get it situated then okay let me just find this real quick mm -hmm. okay i'm almost done I'm going to have to go to the, my email or, uh, oh no, what Malachi said he couldn't get in. Oh, well, I'll have to catch up with him. Okay, Jessica sent me one that I could, she sent it, we could use her affidavit to look. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, where is this affidavit at? Ooh. Mm -hmm. One second. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, one second. All right, so let me just share screen share now. This is the affidavit that actually came with from one of our members who um, just used the affidavit form that we have right here. They didn't have to drop their own one. They used Save Our Kids one that made it very easy for them and us. So let's check it out. So as you can see, I got this right here in my email and they have their birth date, their name, what information and stuff like that. I'm going to scroll past that. And she has here the title and the people who did what they did. Caseworker supervisor, Allegheny County Office of Children, Youth and Family Services. What did they violate? Social worker licenses. She didn't not qualify to diagnose for mental health social worker licenses. Um, well, she actually listed these things here. Let me see if she told her story. She listed all of her, uh, all the things that were violated, but did she say what happened, tell her personal story? Okay, so here's a little bit of the story. At mid-afternoon time, five unnamed agents from the Allegheny County Office of Children, Youth and Families along with the UMPC hospital police officer arrived at my post labor unit at the hospital where Jessica Kirby had just given birth and they told her that she must give them her two day old baby so that the baby may stay at a foster home. So the, um, I do have to correct some of the writing, but um, you know, you write best that you can, you guys, the, the court is not expecting this so much. So I don't really correct them as long as it's legible. It was later discovered 
that caseworker supervisor Rebecca Thompson had petitioned the hearing officer to have Jessica Curry's baby taken from her without providing reasonable efforts to prevent or eliminate the, the need for the removal of the child from home. Let's see. So she, she cites here some more of the violations, which is fine. Um, I wouldn't mind hearing some more about the story, but she has it kind of sprinkled in throughout here. And um, we can, I guess you can read it. Um, you know, she has a, a, a little bit of what happened to her and then she has the right that was violated, which I think is very helpful. And then she has the pictures that support whatever happened at that incident. Um, so I probably like a little bit more dialogue, but it's really up to you how much you wanna write. You just want us to talk about what incident happened um, on this day they came they didn't provide reasonable efforts or on this day I went to court and they didn't allow me to speak and therefore they have violated my right to have due process and we have a, a, a fair hearing um, on this day May 19th 2015 um, they subjected me they said that I uh, let me think um, they refused to give my children back even though I had completed my case plan and show, showed progress and they and I'd never abused anyone. So there's all types of ways you can write your case, but just give a date or approximate date or who, who did it. If you don't know the social worker's name, then list the agency, LA DCFS or whoever it may be. And then you just take it from there. Um, and they fit and she filled this out on the website. So you just kind of just type it and, you know, let's just go, let me just go to it real quick. Let me go back, do a little more screen share. So if I go to um, saveourkids.com and then I go to take action and I go to submit affidavit form. Then you write your name, your birth date, your address and whatever you else you want to and then however many defendants you want to talk about is however many you talk about but after each defendant if it was one social worker who did something then you want to talk about what they did exclusively in that paragraph and just talk about that one person and what they did so it, social worker x did this on this day and then the next defendant police officer did this on this day and then the next defendant judge this and that did this on this day he told me that um he doesn't like black people and he's not going to help them do anything and he discriminated against my um he discriminates against me based on my skin color on june 5th 2019 at a hearing in open court and here i have the transcript of him saying that Right, so then after you do that, you just tell your story. So date, year, May, 2015, the parties, Teresa Mesa, social worker, two officers and the social worker came to my house and removed my children without providing reasonable efforts to prevent removal. They claimed that I was I had a mental health problem, but they can't prove that because they're not, um, they're not, so they're not doctors. So they are practicing law, they're practicing medicine without a license by trying to diagnose me with something that they don't know for sure. They're supposed to help me with my kids, not take them if they're not in danger. So you want to tell that story. Let me see. And then you want to add anything here. That's it, you guys. Um, we, we've done most of the hard work for you, which means we're the ones doing like the stuff that goes, that's saying the cause of action. You just have to prove that you experienced it, that you were injured. Just prove your injury, you guys. That prove that you're that you were harmed. And um, that's all you have to do. If you lost your job, if if you lost, um, if the people in, in the community won't speak to you anymore because they think you're a child abuser, that's something that you can add to it. If um, and if and if it's been four years, then you want to add that times four. If it's 20 years, you want that that times 20. So the longer it's been going on, the more damages you've had and the more injuries you've done and the more kids that they were taking. Obviously, they took one kid versus taking five kids. That's more damage too. So um, 
And do I have any questions here? Um, to um, set up an appointment with you, I go to saveourkids.com too. Yes, yeah, set up appointment with saveourkids.com. And we're not going to have a meeting next Monday, but we'll have a meeting after that. We're going to do it every two weeks instead of every one week now that we've kind of gotten the ball rolling. Okay, so I won't hear from you next week. Yeah, but you can say, but yeah, set up appointment for any time. Um, okay. And then you just kind of have something written up and you can email it to me before our, our appointment and then I can pull it up and we can look at it while okay. we're talking. I just have a few questions that I need to ask and a few things I need to let you know about my own self so I can feel like I'm more caught up to speak with you. Okay, we have let's set up a private one on one to get that make that happen. Okay, then. and then um, but do that on Friday, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, man. Right. Like, Thanks you everyone it. for joining us. I'm glad you Thank can make you. it, John. Nice seeing you all again and take a break. See and we'll you. come back and meet together later, you guys. And just remember it's all about making it through the finish line. Don't let anybody discourage you. Okay, so you're not gonna send us anything um for next week, right? Oh uh, yeah, no meeting next week, but just keep looking on the website. Okay. I'll send out emails because I'm gonna put updates on the website for you to just go to and look at. Okay. And just, you know, um, for your own reference. And I'm not getting uh I didn't get this is the second time I didn't get an email from you for the um video, but I received when um, when when you sent that we um our lawsuit was accepted. I got that though. So, so I don't know. Uh, Okay, hopefully he's gonna, hopefully I'm still getting the bugs out because, you know, this is new to me, the technology website stuff, but I appreciate you guys for bearing with me. And, Cause it's not easy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're awesome. And your daughter's beautiful, by the way. Thank you. God bless you. Thank bye you. mom, bye grandma, bye dads. Bye. Good night. Bye, bye. Good night. thank you, bye. Thank you. Okay. I don't know.